Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, JC. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to be talking about honeybees, and we'd like to thank Krista and James for mentioning our podcast on their podcast, (laughs) and they have a film review podcast, and it's called The Film Within a Podcast. We had an interview with LawnServe, and they have a subscription lawn care program. There are drawings dating back about 10,000 years showing people collecting honey from beehives, and there's evidence around 9,000 years ago that people were using pottery to keep bees. The ancient Maya were beekeepers, and the Smithsonian Research Institute says it looks like the Mayans were harvesting honey from a stingless species for thousands of years, and they used the honey as a sweetener and an antibiotic. And the ancient Egyptians kept bees for honey. And Pliny the Elder, he wrote about honey and bees. And he said, honey is heavenly. It's a sort of saliva of the stars. (laughs) He also wrote about beekeepers in Italy who kept beehives on boats. And they would travel around allowing the bees to feed on flowers and crops. And when the boat sank to a certain level, they knew it was time to collect the honey. Hmm. Interesting, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. There are a lot of different species of bees, and two of the most important for crop pollination are honey and bumblebee. And the honeybee is usually about a half an inch long. The University of Tennessee says the average worker is only going to live five to six weeks. Mm, And they have a variety of different jobs. So scouts will go out and look for sources of water, nectar, and pollen. And once they find the source, they let the other bees know the location. And then nectar collectors, pollen foragers, and water gatherers will take over and bring back the food and water. And they do it with such focus that they beat their wings ragged, and they actually work themselves to death after about 500 miles of flight. Wow, this is depressing, (laughs) JC. There are a few theories on how bees communicate, and there's a combination of different ways. The honeybee dance, though, is one of the ways they communicate. And scientists say there's two main dances, a round dance if the food is less than 50 meters and a waggle dance for longer distances. Hmm. And the shape and the direction of the dance, along with its speed, lets other bees know the direction and the distance. And then if they found flowers, they'll share the scent to make it easier to find. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Harvard University says honeybees have a variety of jobs. There's one queen that can lay a thousand or more eggs a day, and she can live three to four years. Mm, It's good to be the queen. (laughs) Workers are infertile females that start out cleaning the hive and feed the larva. As they get older, they start... What, like two weeks old? (laughs) (laughs) Once they get older, they start building comb cells so honey can be stored. As they get even older... They help take water, nectar, and pollen from foraging workers. Some become workers and protect the hive. Some will go out and forage for food and water. Some will continue to work inside the hive. And drones are male bees, and their main job is to fertilize the queen. Hmm. Scientists say over a third of the world's crops need bees for pollination, which is the transfer of pollen to the stigma of a plant. Hmm. And this is what causes seeds and fruit to be produced. And over two-thirds of all crops depend on insect or animals for pollination. The Natural Resources Defense Council says we need bees to produce apples, oranges, lemons, limes, broccoli, onion, blueberries, cherries, cranberries, cucumbers, cantaloupe, carrots, avocados, and other crops along with wild plants. And they say almonds now depend entirely on honeybees for pollination. Hmm, interesting. This is wild that bees are collecting pollen and nectar from plants just for their own food. Right. And in the process, they're creating food for us. It's nice of them. The White House Office of the Press Secretary says honeybees account for more than $15 billion worth of fruits, nuts, and vegetables a year in the U.S. And honeybees produce about $150 million worth of honey in the U.S. every year. Hmm. The number of managed honeybee colonies has been declining over the past 60 years from around 6 million beehives to under 3 million beehives now. And they say if the decline continues, it's going to start to threaten our food crops. Hmm. 
One of the biggest concerns is this rapid loss of bees in a hive, and it's called colony collapse disorder. Researchers think there's a lot of reasons for it. Their main reasons are pesticides. In the U.S., we're still allowing many chemicals that have been banned in other countries. A loss of habitat and monocultures. So you have one or two crops grown in large areas with all the flowers and wild plants removed. So there's no food variety for bees. Hmm. And then parasites and disease. Mites are killing bees because they're not as healthy because of this loss of plants needed for good nutrition. And then global warming is changing blooming times and creating more bee pathogens. Penn State University did a study with bees from 23 states looking at their wax, pollen, the hive, and individual bees. And they found over 100 different types of pesticides in 900 samples. And a majority of the wax and pollen had at least one pesticide. And many of the hive and pollen samples had up to six pesticides in them. Purdue University says one of the big problems is farmers using seeds pre-treated with chemicals to help prevent pests. And these chemicals are now in the plant and the soil, and they say it's affecting bees. If you're using pesticides around your house to prevent pests from getting inside, you don't want to allow the spray or powder to get on flowering plants. So don't apply it when bees are flying. Bees are going to be less active one hour after sunset to about two hours before sunrise. And they're less active when temperatures are below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. And you wouldn't want to apply it on windy days. And look at the labels. Only use the minimum amount required. And the EPA requires a bee hazard warning if the chemical is known to be toxic to bees. What about garden plants? Yeah, there's more and more organic or less toxic products like neem oil. It's N-E-E-M. It's non-toxic to bees but it kills most bad bugs and it doesn't hurt most of the good ones. And this regulates the insect's hormones so they stop eating and reproducing. Mm -hmm. So if you have aphids, mealybugs, or mites in your garden, this is great because it's not going to affect the honeybees. Scientists say to help bees, you should plant more bee-friendly flowers and provide a shallow source of clean water. So bees are getting pro- Like what, in a dish? Yeah, a little bee dish. (laughs) Bees are getting their protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals from the pollen and carbohydrates from nectar. And by planting more bee-friendly flowers, you're also going to help the pollination of your garden, if you have one. Hmm. You should plant flowers that bloom at different times of the year and look for flowers that supply plenty of nectar for energy and easy-to-access pollen. So experts are suggesting pale purple coneflowers, common yarrow, sunflowers, giant hyssop, Horse mint, black-eyed Susans, asters, goldenrods, chrysanthemums, and tulips. And some I think you definitely made up some of those. <laughs> Horse mint. <laughs> and some herbs that are healthy for bees are basil, sage, lavender, and rosemary. And you can plant them in your landscape areas, potted plants in open fields, plant them in parks by you, the side of the road, plant some flowers for the honeybees. <laughs> kind of like John Chapman. And who's that, J.C.? Johnny Appleseed. Ah. So Johnny Appleseed started planting apple trees in 1792 when he was 18 years old, and his goal was to plant enough apples for settlers heading west so they'd always have something to eat. But he was planting mainly cider apple trees, and these apples are actually best for making hard cider, which is an alcoholic drink, very (laughs) popular with the pioneers of the time. So he would find good locations, build a fence with logs or vines, and plant his seeds. And he bought and sold this land he developed with apple trees and accumulated quite a bit of cash. Mm -hmm. But they say he buried it along his roots in holes rather than using banks. (laughs) And he didn't believe in hurting animals, so he became a vegetarian. And in Nova, Ohio, there's a 176-year-old tree that's known to have been planted by Johnny Appleseed. So there could still be money that's planted yeah, by him? Yeah, um, yeah. Treasure hunt, man. <laughs> Nova, Ohio. <laughs> Start there. <laughs> a common problem with honeybees is a hive under the eaves of your roof, in your attic, or inside a wall. And when you have a hive in or on your home, you could have around 30,000 bees. Wow. So rather than killing the bees with insecticides, which is very difficult to do, especially if it's inside your home, you can hire a bee removal company. And I spoke to Peter from Humdinger Honey, 
and he gave me a few tips. He suggested taking a few pictures to identify the type of bee it is, and then go online to find your local beekeepers club, and they're going to have information on beekeepers or companies that will come to your home and remove the hive and then add those bees to their hives. Huh. Peter said the best time to move bees is early spring and summer. They have the greatest chance of surviving. Later in the year, it's usually better to wait till the next spring. And honeybees usually like 14 to 21 feet off the ground. So when one of these companies come, the fee is usually based on how much work it's going to be to remove them, especially mm -hmm. if they're inside your home. And if they are in your walls, once they're removed, you have to use a sealer primer and oil-based paint to prevent the odor from the beehive from attracting new bees. <laughs> so a great routine every year is to seal up any cracks and openings to prevent bees and other pests from getting into your home. And it's so important, especially up on your eaves and anywhere where bees can get into your attic to prevent that. If you have a swarm on a tree, so this is a huge group of bees that are all clung to each other, mm -hmm. it could be about 10,000 bees ready to start a new hive. Wow. And that swarm sends out scouts to find a good location for the new hive. So the scouts come back and they do a dance to show where they found a good spot, and they also do the dance in how excited they are about it. <laughs> so other bees will go check that out, and they'll come back, and then they'll dance, Meanwhile, you've got all these other scouts going to different locations, and they come back, and other bees will check that out. And the more excited they get about it, and the more bees that are excited about a location, they take a vote, and then the hive decides where to go. Wow. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? <laughs> if you have a swarm in a tree by your home, and you get a beekeeper or one of these removal companies out there fast enough, there's usually going to be a very small or no fee for them to remove it, especially if it's going to be easy. A lot of times they'll just knock this whole mass into a box and remove it because mm. that swarm is surrounding the queen, protecting her with their bodies, and they're all clinging to each other. It's pretty wild. They say the buzzing is very loud. <laughs> I bet. And you don't want to take a chance of just leaving it because the scouts may decide that, you know, your walls or your attic are the best place for the new hive. <laughs> If you're in the Lake County area in Illinois or southeast Wisconsin and have a honeybee problem around or in your home, you can call Peter, and he's at 262-945-6033, or you can email him at humdingerhoney at gmail.com. You're not going to spell that? Humdinger is H-U-M-D-I-N-G-E-R, honey, at gmail.com. I spoke to Jim from Bush Brothers Beekeeping, and he said if you have a hive or bees going into your home, you need to remove them correctly and quickly because that colony is going to continue to grow, and the bees will eventually find their way into your living space. And over time, the honey will start to leak, especially if the bees aren't there to maintain it. And that leaking honey attracts wax moths, ants, termites, wax beetles, and other pests. And if the hive is in your attic or walls, it has to be completely cleaned out and the area masked by anti-pheromones, hmm. which is interesting. So Jim said there's a saying, bees like to be where bees have been. <laughs> he said he's seen homeowners hire exterminators to spray a hive in an attic or walls, and they don't completely remove the hive or seal the area. So now new bees will set up a colony in that area, and now to remove the hive, you're dealing with toxic chemicals and you're poisoning these honeybees. Hmm. So he emphasized, if you have a bee problem, hire a trained beekeeper for the removal. Okay. So if you're in the western or central New York area, you can call Jim at 716-578-1812. Or you can email them at honeybees, with an S, so it's H-O-N-E-Y-B-E-E-S, at localnet.com. And they'll add your bees to their hives, and it helps pollinate the crops for all the local farmers in the area. Mm, nice. There's a website you can go to online. It's called beeremovalsource.com, and you can search by state and you can call or email a local beekeeper. I spoke to Troy and Nick from LawnServe, and they have some great lawn tips and some information on their lawn care subscription program. Why don't you spell it? LawnServe is L-A-W-N, capital S-E-R-V. Thank you. How you doing, guys? 
Cindy and I found your company when we were researching soil tests and hoped you could share some information on your service. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you uh, giving us the chance. We're excited to discuss more today. Great. I had spent a, a bit of time back in, in consulting and uh, had, had a, a number of clients in the ag space. And and we really saw soil testing technology being used at, at a commercial farm level to make agriculture more efficient and to really be more targeted about how we grow, you know, millions of acres of crops. And, uh, and so thought, you know, there's got to be a way to, to apply this to residential lawn and really finding ways to, to make the application of fertilizers and nutrients for your, your yard a lot more targeted, a lot more efficient. I had met Troy, our, my, my co-founder in uh, business school. And so, uh, you know, we, we sat down one day and, and thought to ourselves, we've got to find a way to bring that technology that, that these larger commercial farms use down to the consumer and residential level to get a great lawn. And so uh, Lawn Serve was born. It's interesting because I don't think most people ever take the time, like the average homeowner, to test their soil. That's right. There's two things that we typically saw when we were first launching or before we had launched Lawn Serve here. When we were talking to homeowners and consumers, the number one thing that, that we found actually a little bit disturbing was that homeowners didn't know the exact size of their lot. <laughs> so the number one thing we actually did is we went out and built a lawn sizing tool. You can find it just on its own at myyardsize.com. It's also hosted through our website and part of the onboarding process when a customer signs up for LawnServe. But essentially what it allows them to do is use Google Maps technology overlooking their house from an aerial view and plot a few points around their yard, cutting out their house and their driveway and get an exact square footage. So that way we can custom tailor the products and the amount of products they're getting specifically to their yard. But then to your point also here, the, the soil testing was the, the number two problem that we saw with homeowners. Extension schools like UMass Amherst up here in, in Massachusetts and throughout the country have tested soil. And as Nick spoke to, the commercial level has always tested the soil to try to have a better understanding of what nutrient levels you really need to look to amend to grow the healthy crop or grass in this case. With those two things combined, we can really get the right amount of product based on the nutrient levels and based on the getting the right yard sizing up front. And that solves a lot of customers' problems. I'd say the third problem is just consistency. Getting product down on your lawn consistently throughout the year, whether it be getting pre-emergent down early on in the spring or post-emergent after you know dandelions pop to try to fight the weeds. Also getting the right pH balancers on your yard throughout the year. That's going to be all key things that need to be deployed month over month, not all at one time at the beginning of the year and, and just sort of set it and forget it. It's really a consistency approach. And that's why we created LawnServe in this methodology of the subscription box. Based on your climate, you'll get a box each month sent directly to your door. And all you really have to do is, is actually just apply the product. And it'll change throughout the year based on your season, whether you need pre-emergent in the spring or bug control in, in the spring and summer, or you need some winterizer you know, in, in the late fall sort of prepping for, for the winter seasons. And that's all dependent also on where you are in the country, whether you're warm season grass or cool season grass in the north or south. One of the additional things, just to expand on that a little bit, is one of the things that we found is there's a, a lot of reliance on your big box store or the hardware store in general. And, and a lot of what we found was kind of the strategy that, that homeowners were going after was go to the store, ask a couple of questions and, and rely on, you know, the, the flashiest sale or, or the most obvious uh, bag at, at the store, bring it home, put it on my lawn and, and kind of hope from there. Right. And as, as Troy was mentioning, you know, that results in most often over application. People think that more is better, which is, is definitely not the case and, and actually puts your lawn in a much weaker and potentially harmful state. Interesting. Uh, it also is not targeted to what your lawn needs. So while there are a lot of people that, that would benefit from general purpose nutrient application, we've definitely found that by pursuing a more targeted approach, you're able to use less product overall. You're able to use 
targeted products that, that get specifically at your issues rather than some of the general purpose products that, that maybe have eight or 10 things in them that, that you don't need. And so we're, we're really finding, in, in addition to the consistency that, that Troy had mentioned, that using this targeted approach allows a, a much more effective strategy overall. Yeah, I think it's very smart because a couple of things, you know, one is if you run to the hardware store and you buy a 15,000 square foot bag of fertilizer, I think you do have the tendency to want to use it. I spent the money for it. And if a little's good, a lot's got to be better. So you're overusing it. And I like the idea that you guys are custom building the nutrients based on location and also a soil test. We also try to take in other factors in, in addition to that. So we work with soil temperature APIs, which will allow us to understand when your soil temperature in your region is, for instance, reaching that 55 degree mark, which is talked about a lot for seed germination. And when we hit that mark, that's when you're going to see weed seeds start to germinate and sprout. And so we'll keep an eye on that based on your location in the country. And we'll make sure that we're getting you the right pre-emergent product to battle that. We'll also keep an eye on, on weather data. So how much rain you're getting in your area, for instance, or what the temperature is. So you're not applying post-emergent product, you know, in, in the heat of summer when it's over 85 degrees. And, and that's likely going to be harmful to the blades of grass on, on your yard. Or if you haven't had enough water, you know, we send out water in your yard reminders and all of those things that we can help homeowners that maybe if they have a little bit of insecurity about how to maintain their yard or if something's gone a little bit wrong in the past with some of the products that they've used without having the education, we're able to really coach them and, and nurture them through that process to really make it that much easier. With all the technology that we have today, it's, it's simple for us to host our blog, which has all of our, our how-to videos and all of our great walkthroughs of, of why these products work. And they can always call us or shoot us an email or snap a picture of, of a, a weed they're seeing in their yard. And, and our lawn team will actually go through and identify what type of weed that is and then further custom tailor their product to make sure they get the right products to address any specific issues they're seeing in their yard. Um, and and they, they don't really have to worry about the science of it. They just have to apply the product when it comes and watch the videos and, and communicate with us and, and really relax and enjoy the lawn, you know? Yeah. So what are a few of the key things a homeowner should be doing for their lawn? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So, you know, there, there really are a number of, of kind of best practices that, that we always suggest. The first and, and arguably the most important is, is really testing the soil. So really you want to understand what's going on with the soil health, which, which ultimately is the key to growing your grass. Your, your grass is a plant after all, and, and we want to make sure that plant has all the different nutrients and, and there aren't any underlying issues that would prevent that beautiful golf course-like grass from, from growing out in your yard. So once you have the, the soil test, the next thing that we really suggest is getting a pre-emergent down, typically in the spring. There are a couple of other times during the year when you can apply, but, but we think that, that the spring is really the most important time. The key there is really timing, though. And so, you know, Troy had mentioned a little bit earlier in the podcast that we take a look at climate and, and weather APIs to make sure that we're timing that pre-emergent, that we're putting it down when the soil is the right temperature. And then from there, if you can get that pre-emergent down, you know, throughout the season, you know, really it's, it's kind of about maintenance. So it's, it's giving your, your lawn the, the right amount of food at the right times and, and not over applying. We want to correct any uh, pH and, and nutrient pH uh, imbalance issues and nutrient deficiencies throughout the year. And then ultimately what that does is it provides a, a great soil environment for overseeding, which, which we typically uh, recommend happens in the fall. A couple of things I'll, I'll add to, to Nick's comments there. A big difference maker that, that homeowners can get a little lazy on is, is the hand weeding. If, if you have a big gnarly weed in your, in your yard, going out there with a screwdriver or a shovel or a grandpa's weeder or whatever it may be, and hand weeding those will make a huge difference throughout the year. If you follow it up with a little bit of seed and soil mix to fill the hole so another weed doesn't just grow in that spot, that's going to be something they can do each and every time as they're, as they're mowing their lawn. It's going to make a big difference. One thing Nick mentioned also was, was the overseeding. If you're in the south, you're typically going to look, look at a plug program that you'll be doing in the, in the spring as, as their process is, is a little bit different. And I'd also say watering is tremendous. No matter how much product you put on your yard, 
if your yard's not getting the right amount of water, it's going to be hard for it to really absorb those nutrients and, and grow a healthy plant. And we typically will recommend instead of watering shorter times more frequently, we actually recommend watering for a longer time less frequently, trying to drive that water down into the soil further which really will draw the roots down further and, and allow that plant to, to sustain drought-like conditions longer by having that deeper root system. If we wanted to learn more about Lawn Serve, where would we go? So you can definitely check us out on our website. It's lawnserve.com, L-A-W-N-S-E-R-V.com. You can also go to our blog. That's just blog.lawnserve.com. Those, those are all great resources. You can shoot us an email, give us a call. All that information is on our website. You know, we look we look forward to changing the landscape of lawn care. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye. Great. Okay. Thanks. That was a great interview. I like how they start with a soil test to build a program for a healthy lawn and measuring your lawn so you know exactly how much product you should be using right. and how much you should put down. They have a very complete program. Do you have anything else to add? Be kind to honeybees. Yeah. Plant bee-friendly plants. Don't use chemicals toxic to bees because we are in trouble if the honeybees keep dying. Mm. Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, Himalaya, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Book 1 through 6. Soon, Book 7. Cindy is working hard on Book 7. <laughs> if you enjoyed it, please give us a five-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com. You can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. And you can follow us now on Instagram. Fix it home improvement. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week.